First of all, when you write something like this, you have different audiences. You have to address those audiences. Are you writing this thing for the specialist in your field that know if you're using a jargon, for example, they would know? If you want a wider audience, you have to be as, as, uh, as open as possible. You can't use jargons that you think people on the street. So that is probably the most important thing about writing because you have to know who your audience is. And when you write these kind of stuff, I, if you write, write a textbook for, uh, for uh, college students, for example, it's quite different than if you're writing a mon monograph. It's like uh, breathing. The reader is uh, reading... Uh, 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 uh. Don't give two, three long sentences back, back to back. You can always cut long sentences into short ones. So this kind of writing helps a lot because history writing tends to be boring and long. And that that uh, ease the tension the reader usually rests the uh, reader when they read these things. You have been thinking two million things. Take things out. Revision is the time that you finally look at the thing as one. And then here are the the things that I try to accomplish. What clearly is my argument. It has to be stated very clearly in the introduction. And then I go to, do I have, do I have enough documentation to support these points? And then just basically in the conclusion, I usually restate these things. Paragraph by paragraph. Okay, I have this paragraph. In one sentence, what am I saying in this paragraph? Why did I wrote this paragraph? Did I write it because it argues for something? Why? And then the next paragraph. So I have, let's say, 10 pages article. 10 pages has, uh, let's say, 50 paragraphs. Okay? So I have 50 sentences just to summarize the article. Each paragraph has one thesis statement, so I'm putting that thesis statement. And then I look at those things if they flow. If one paragraph should come before, maybe this document, maybe this argument should come before. Maybe I should make this uh, argument that I put them in the introduction at the end, or usually the reverse. Say it to hook people. So introduction is probably the most important part to write because you're trying to get people's attention. Once you have all. Once work. you have all these things on, and then you say, well, maybe the conclusion that I mentioned this, people should not wait this long. I should say this in the introduction. Closer. Okay, so I guess maybe take me through the project, maybe starting from where did you get the idea? Okay, uh, this idea, uh, before I start graduate school, this was the uh, original idea that I had, and I was planning to write a book on this subject uh, as my dissertation. But uh, the uh, at that time, it was not that easy to write it for political reasons, yeah. a book of that sort. So I, I changed my mind and I wrote my first book on a different subject, on Scourge, that one. Then. So this book was, this book in, was the, in, in the whims in, waiting. Yes, and I was just trying to collect things. So the completion of this book took over 10 years. Over 10 years? Yeah. Wow. This was a pet project. I mean, I was always thinking to write something and finally, and I was adding to it, but meantime I was focusing on my first book yeah. that came. And what was the point at which you realized that this could occur, this could come to fruition? I mean, after well, 10 years of research, there uh, was a moment where you were like, okay, I can do this, it's ready. I have actually written uh, certain chapters of it during that time as conference papers. Mm -hmm. And then I got feedbacks from colleagues. So all I had to do is to write one more chapter and put all these things together in a very cohesive way to connect the other things that I have done and then incorporate those uh, feedbacks that I received from my colleagues. Okay. It, um, I start working on that, I would say, 2008. So it took me two years to, uh, well, it took me one year to complete everything, but mm -hmm. then you send it to the publisher and all that stuff takes yeah. another year. How did you acquire uh, some of the information that you needed for this book? I mean, well, you, you, you have to look for evidence. For example, first, 
you have a, a working hypothesis. I want uh, this is probably what happened, but this is a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. You don't know if it's true or not. The 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 hypothesis that you have before you start your uh, research is very different than hypothesis that you end up with because everything depends on what you find, how you can support it. In scholarship, you have to have hard evidence. You can't you can't you cannot you cannot say this is what happened based on assertions. So you can say these are the documents. So then you have to look for documents. What kind of documents you find? The problem is those documents are not very easy to find. You have to look for two million different places. It takes a huge time. And one document does not necessarily uh, prove a point. So you have to find a supporting document. Then what you do is you collect all these things. You try to sort them out. And then you see if there are any two independent uh, documents that confirm one point. Then you can say that this is something that we can uh, safely state. But there are a lot of good documents that you cannot find a supporting point because it doesn't exist. That doesn't mean they're wrong. Yet you can you basically rank them second in reliability, saying that I have this document, but it's waiting for confirmation. So those are the things that I try to accomplish, and that, that's that's a good scholarship, I believe. Otherwise, they they find the rumor sometimes, and then they write as a fact, like newspaper articles. That uh, and most of the thing that when I teach this thing, I ask students to write as if you're not hundred percent, even hundred percent, you can't be one hundred percent. That's why Nine, history 9, 9, is 9. yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's the closest you can get because you don't know what uh, who those uh, write, write those things, wrote those things. At that time, we're talking about two, three hundred years before. You know what? Even I was writing you reading because new things are coming in. You're trying to incorporate. I would say at least a decade for this one. So you basically research while you're writing. While you're writing, and then something comes up. That's the killer. You have a beautiful chapter, and then a document comes up contradicts what you're writing. <laughs> Either you change and, everything, and so or what do you, you have do? to find an arc. Yeah, you, you have to. You have to address. Yes. Here's another thing that could be interesting. There was a, a, a wonderful document that I found in British archives. Yet I forgot to write down uh, the, the uh, folder number. I remember I took the notes, direct quotations. It supports beautifully the point that I was trying to make. I, I had to take it out because I couldn't find the uh, footnote. Yeah. So, I mean, most people take this thing very lightly. They say, well, that's, I saw it. No, you have to prove it. You have to give them the footnotes that if someone wants to check it, you can go find it. Uh, so, when I'm reading published material, like books, secondary material, I'm looking basically what is available. And also, is there any argument that I can challenge with my documents? But when I'm looking for uh, documents, I, I basically, I have to go first what's available there. When I see a document, I remember, I look at my notes and say, look, this guy made this argument, but there's a document contradicting that. It's worth noting. It's something that should be published. So I put that thing aside. So this uh, source will challenge, say, see, compare it to a uh, so-and-so book, uh, five page, uh, page five. Uh, but when I'm looking at the primary sources, so I'm always, is there anything that contradicts to the uh, what's already published, or is there anything that is new? And the second thing when I'm reading uh, these primary documents, how reliable are they? Can we really say this by looking at these things or do I need a secondary document? There are some, there are some primary documents, for example, that uh, contradicts um, certain things, but there's only one. Like in uh, American archives, I found a, a handwritten letter of a Turkish president. You don't need a supporting evidence for that. It's already there. A lot of writing study scholars believe that texts are connected to each other and are dependent on other texts, like and we call that intertextuality. Can you speak to that connection? Yes, well, you I mean, once that? you start writing something like this, in the introduction you have to set the scene. You have to talk about the available scholarship and where this particular book fits in, where is the gap and how this uh, covers that whole. So you have to basically talk about what the previous scholarship, talk about what evidence they found, and why this book is important, or why is your paper important, why should people read it, what, what original data you are, or interpretation, something has to be original. 
for a monograph to happen. Otherwise, you have the textbooks. So most students confuse uh, are the two. Monographs are making original arguments. Textbooks are basically they're they're collecting what's available and telling the story. So if you wanna, and then you have to you have to talk about that thing right in the beginning, placing your book in the current scholarship. And that's called literature survey. Or literature review or, or literature something. Review. Yeah, similar. So and then you can say, well, there, there is this book on the similar subject, but they don't talk about this, or they don't come to the same conclusion. So you have to say why your work is unique. One thing that I learned. I'm not a native speaker. This is easier for me. But uh, I learn, and I, I say this thing. Some people think that the more complicated sentences you make, the better or the more sophisticated you sound. That is absolutely not true. Sentences should be short, sentences should be readable, sentences should be as simple as possible because you're trying to communicate an idea with a larger audience. Sometimes you can read a sentence, a whole paragraph, at the end you read two, three times, you don't catch one word, you don't understand what the heck they're talking about. They fail. Because the idea, the reason you're writing this thing, for other people to read and understand it. For that reason, the simple way to write... Uh, a lot of students think revision is, is editing. Yeah, that's and not. Maybe speak that's to that. That's copy so, editing. Yeah. So. That comes last. Now, once you are uh, convinced that this, what you put, I mean, as I said, I'm not a native speaker, so there are huge mistakes. Mm -hmm. But the ideas are there. I mean, if a native speaker reads this piece, it's not necessarily native speakers, even on my own language, sometimes you, you don't catch these mistakes. Yeah. That's why we have copy editors. I would say the research, the brainstorming, all these things are the bricks of the building. Copy editing is the paint. It would make it look good. But without that, you still have substance. Uh, sometimes I write, for example, when I was a grad student, I was writing these uh, sentences. and my advisor would come and say, okay, you have this sentence, Mr. Berg, what do you mean by this? Well, I mean this, why don't you say that? It's very simply you're explaining. If you have to explain, it, you, you fail. You basically, I mean, that is the most important thing besides what the substance, the presentation, the writing style. Sentences should not be that long. And then they have this fun stuff. Uh, so the historians, the writing is very concise. It should be very concise. I mean, it's not like uh, like literature. Uh, it's a little different, but you're trying to bring in literature, the taste of literature to it, so it could be more readable. I collect these things. I start reading. I have all these microfilms, for example. As I as I read these documents, I take notes. I take notes and and very different ways, you know, usually stickies, wherever I found. And then I, I have a notebook, if I have notebook with me, I write it there, but if not, I just write it here and then stick it there. And then when I have all these notes, I look, they are unorganized, very unorganized. Now I have to come up with uh, what documents support what ideas. And then I try to organize those things based on what I find and what my notes are. Let's say we're talking about, um, I'm trying to make an argument that, you know, uh, there are huge biases on certain subject. Based on the documents that I find, I put those stickies all together, and my chart is like, uh, I mean, it's notes everywhere, and then you're trying to connect it, okay, I can, this one support that, and then all these lines, article, uh, source 1 to source 2, source 3 to source 4, so all these things are connected. I know when I'm writing, okay, this is the point I'm trying to make, and here are my sporting ideas with the document numbers. First of all, introduction is the last thing I write. Because you don't know what you're going to write. You start writing, and then, uh, if you write an introduction, you're already biased, because you're trying to force whatever you have into that claim that you're trying to make. So if you write everything, even in the book, the introduction is the last thing. Even after conclusion, I write. I usually do it in a coffee house at this stage. Have a cup of coffee, it's got to be quiet for me, and then see what connections I can make with what I found in these documents. 
what claims are they important? Most of them are trash. I put them aside, maybe for another book that doesn't directly support. But when I go do research, I don't say, okay, I'm going to collect only this subject. I collect whatever. And then sift through. And then sift through them, and then you find certain things that maybe you can use it for this book, but for an article somewhere else. And then the next stage is to organize what, for an article, for example, not a book, for an article. Uh, okay, uh, after looking at these documents, I have an idea what arguments I can make and I can support. And then I can say that, you know, it's worth writing. If I decide it's worth writing because I have enough documents and the argument is solid, important argument that can be published, and then I start uh, organizing these uh, sources. So everything revolves around hard documents, what I can prove. Before I put these things, I know that what ideas I can support, what what uh, statements I can make. But that would change because meantime I'm writing, I'm also, I don't stop reading. And then I find one document and then that would, I can work that in. You get stuck I a do. lot. And, I do. And what do you do? How do you get through that? What's your uh, best? This is what I usually do. I like to discipline myself and you have to write this thing. Okay, how many pages do you think I would say these things? I don't want to write long things because it bores people. The arguments that I have, let's say, you should be able to say these things in a chapter, I would say 40 pages. Okay. I'm going to 40 pages is probably 70, 80 pages uh, typed, uh, book pages. Uh, so I'm going to write 70 pages. I usually focus on writing five pages a day. So I sit down and if I write five pages, that's my goal. Sometimes I write ten pages. But there are days that I cannot write one page. Those mental blocks happen all the time. Sometimes nothing comes to, comes to your mind. And sometimes a lot of things come to your mind. You have to take notes. It's an important argument, very original. If you don't write it down, it goes away. And so I found something that was, what was that? And it doesn't come back to you. So it's just like a 24-hour process. But the mental block sometimes you hit and then I just walk away. There's no point of forcing it. Wait one day, two days. It, usually in two days it comes back to me. Usually when I uh, overcome those moments, I switch it to reading again. Mm. When I'm reading, uh, things come back to me and I start writing. I ask people some poets, they say, you know, they, they become more inspired when they are reading poetry. So you use reading as a tool to help you work to through? To help you go over that uh, blocks.